Janet Joyner from Winston-Salem is our next finalist. She'll be reading Women's History Month. Well, with a title like that, you know this is gonna be a ride somewhere between a Jaguar and a Surrey with a fringe on top. <laughs> One, Pinky, 1974 by Thomas Lawrence. Ever in debt, ever in love, Tommy must have seen in you only one more piece of his horse mill business, painting you, elevated there in your 11th year poised on that windy hill in your grown-up white empire-waisted dress with its pink cummerbund sash mapping our minds to the budding breasts the way hills may build towards natural frontiers or border crossings, and your skirts gossamer floating hemline revealing only a hint of ankle above the one naked pointed black shoe dancing just to step away from the cliff of descent towards that pastoral road below with your head in the clouds flying those pink ribbons of an almost liberated bonnet also in the eponymous pink you will wear into history dressed for the part. Two, Portrait du Négresse, 1800 by Marie Guillemine Benoit. On one wall of the Musée du Louvre, among the gargantuan Jacques-Louis Davids, the Delacroix's and Jericho's, two exquisitely blank, signifying eyes stare out of your modest frame and ask me to read a hieroglyph of some exotic bird in distress, a naked black woman in white headdress, white head wrap like a Phrygian cap that does say something of helmets and courage, of brief, recently won liberté, égalité, before the paint can dry and the little Corsican will deny with his code your road to identity and a third eye, the black nipple of your bared black still unsevered breast aiming straight for the Amazon of my heart and I understand I finally know in my white skin know how subversion is always the mole tunneling between a hawk and a buzzard. Three, two leaves by Georgia O'Keeffe, 1928. It is so yellow, butter yellow, like a dream of yellow of a nimbus sun, that at first you wonder why the leaves is at all, and then your eye registers the brown on the fringes or shading the contours rising from stem and veins liltingly like stitch quilting, telling the story of the top one, the smaller leaf, as it rests lightly there on the slightest of diagonals and almost caters, caters to the leftward swerve ordered by its venial tip reminiscent of her own hand Stieglitz posed like petals askance that leads to the green dentilated edge and base of the leaf below, introducing a new tale, one of asymmetry and chlorophyll, of how or why it chooses to go and seed its blade to this color, to this yellow, like a prologue celebrating while lamenting the flight of light, making us look really look until her limpid yellow lindens both crop and enlarge the composition of this world the way she meant it to. Four, Dark Lady of the Laboratory, Rosalind Franklin, 1920-1958. She might have been pretty if she had taken off those dark glasses and did something interesting with her hair, he said, said Mr. Watson, the fair, of Crick and Watson, the pair, the famous Mr. Watson, who stole her data, 
Rosalind's DNA data, her evidence, the experimental proof of the double helix chain he will claim without mention of her name, her exquisite X-ray photos and the measurements that did explain Shargoff's ratios in the way and why scientists rely on proof as he had not, had not that gadfly who knew where and with whom to spy, how to half lie and dine on another's dime and raw meat to steal her Eureka and then to ford for 50 odd years the long dark nights just to reach a sleep wherein he alone might weep and find Rosalind already dead more than twice over instead. Five, Alice Cobra. 1906, 1950. Above all, she simply didn't look the part. No European knighthood, nor its cash. An American, no less, the upstart. No adventurer's daring do, no dash. Just some immigrant's daughter who's rash enough to flex her brain's acuity at Sir Arthur's Minoan tablet cache with such methodical tenuity against all odds of incredulity and invent a decipherer's science. Crown enough for perpetuity were it not for her female defiance of feeling without methodical proof that to the spear side made her seem so aloof. Six, Ocean's Floor, Marie Tharp, 1920 to 2006, Bruce Hazine, 1924, 1977. Liebespar or not is how the thinking usually went, for only Cupid's bow unbent could pin a woman's heart to stick like a dart to such a chart with such a man is what was thought back then. And so the first to draft, to map, the sonar soundings pinging depths to document the Atlantic's rift and shift to proof of continental drift. This quiet, steadfast female heretic who was content to just find interesting work and not lament her anonymity. Yet it is said that when he died, she cut up his old clothes and had them sewn, repurposed into skirts and jackets of her own. Seven. Emily Dickinson, The Dinner Party, by Judy Chicago. She wouldn't have gone, you know, to sit there in all that pale pink and one hell of a vulva imprisoned in porcelain folds of immobile lace like the skirts of Dresden dolls, or to sit between the garish, bold, spectral-colored Blackwell twisting away from her edges and that big black grand piano of Smythe in her tweeds pushing more boundaries. No, she would have retired to her room to string like Pascal with his pensées on needle and threads her quiet letter to the world, 833 poems full of passion and rage. <laughs> 